Hello, listeners. We want to let you know that we will be presenting at the Pennsylvania Society of Addiction Medicine annual meeting online on March 2nd. You can hear us speak and even see what we look like. After an extensively heated discussion, Sonia and I have picked the 10 articles that we reviewed which changed our practice the most. It's a little embarrassing, but we're going to put ourselves out there and tell you some of the things that we did wrong and how we changed our ways after reading these 10 articles. You can register for the conference at psam-asam.org. Hope to see you all there. This is Addiction Medicine Journal Club. I'm Dr. John Keenan. And I'm Dr. Sonia Del Tredici. We believe that addiction is a disease that can be treated, and we want to help you stay up to date with the latest research that you can use in your addiction medicine practice. This week, we are going to be discussing an article about treating neonatal opioid withdrawal with the Eat Sleep Console Method. How are you doing today, Sonia? I'm doing really well. How are you doing, John? I'm doing fantastic. I I think, as you know, I'm just back from vacation, so certainly uh, fresh and uh, enjoying back in clinical medicine. It's nice to take a break sometimes. It is. Vacation is good. You just have to make sure that too much, so much work doesn't pile up that it's, you know, it ruins all the good feelings from vacation the day you get back. Yeah, I I went to uh, Mount Rainier, so I I was off the grid and I didn't do any work while I was gone for a whole week, which I've never done before. And it was actually fantastic. I think I want to try to unplug that much again. It's awesome. And it makes you realize that you're maybe not as indispensable as you think you are. This is true. So what's going on in the news this uh, this week with you, Sonia? Well, I don't think this will change my practice, but I thought this article was pretty amazing. And it made me laugh, which isn't common for addiction research. Usually addiction research is kind of depressing. But this article brought joy to my day, and I wanted to share it with everybody else. So there were some goofballs from the University of Oregon, and they did a study on nematodes and the increased, quote, hedonic feeding, unquote, after being exposed to anandamide, which is one of the endocannabinoids. Basically, the nematodes were exposed to the endocannabinoid, and after that exposure, they ate more and had an increased preference for more nutrient-rich foods, just like when people get the munchies with cannabis. I also really loved the use of their phrase, hedonic amplification of feeding, to describe the phenomenon of increased food intake with cannabis. So I'm just going to quote the authors here. They say, quote, our findings reveal a surprising degree of functional conservation in the effects of endocannabinoids on hedonic feeding across species. So the response seems to be exactly the same in humans and nematodes and is likely found in all the animals in between. So anyone who's interested, this paper was published in the journal Current Biology, and we'll put a link in the show notes but we've been using the phrase hedonic amplification of feeding to describe the food intake in my house with the uh, several teenagers who live here. So I just thought this was pretty fun, and I'm glad that some people are doing research that makes you laugh. I don't know if they meant to be funny, but I thought it was pretty funny. It is kind of funny. (laughs) Hedonic amplification of feeding. I feel like the, the resident physicians feel that way all the time when they're on call. Yeah, totally. Well, how about you, John? Anything you want to share with our listeners regarding addiction in the news? Yeah, this must be like animal study week because I think we're like thinking on the same wavelength. I just kind of wanted to share a a very interesting journal article, not go in depth with it, but just something to be aware of for our listeners. So this is from uh, the Journal of Clinical Investigation. And basically, this was a study out of UCLA. And it was looking at the GLP-1 analog semi-glutide to decrease uh, alcohol-related binge drinking in mice. Um, and the title of the article is The Glucagon-Like Peptide Analog Semiglutide Reduces Alcohol Drinking and Modulates Central GABA Transmission. And I think it's interesting, just something to keep in mind. It's not ready for prime time yet, but certainly uh, these medications, the GLP-1 agonists, we're using them a lot anymore. Not only were they classically used for diabetes, but now there's labeling and FDA approval for weight loss. There's also cardiovascular benefits in people with a history of heart disease. And so certainly another FDA approval or FDA indication would be very interesting. And basically in the study, mice that were treated with this drug, they had uh, decreased episodes of binge drinking and decreased episodes of uh, dependence-induced drinking. So certainly a promising target. I do treat alcohol use disorder in the clinic, and I feel like the current therapies, typically naltrexone and camprosate, they're the best we have, but it would be nice to have a couple of extra FDA-approved items in the toolbox eventually. I mean, everybody is waiting for this study, the study on semaglutide and alcohol 
consumption. I mean, there's just been a ton of anecdotal stories about people not only losing their desire for food, but losing their desire for alcohol and other compulsive behaviors once they start the semaglutide or other related medications. I think there was a editorial or an essay in the New York Times this week about the nature of desire and what it means that your desire for all these things that has become compulsive can just be easily eliminated with a once weekly injection. What does that even mean about desire? It really takes it from the more you know, spiritual or psychological realm to the purely biochemical. And that's, I think, shaken a bunch of people a little bit. I'm sure it's more than just biochemical. I mean, there's definitely kind of prefrontal cortex as well involved with these. So I'm sure there's there's multiple areas here that are, are feeding into it, but certainly another target would be very interesting. And you're right, if you could really decrease the the physiological drive for these, could you kind of rewire how your brain thinks to kind of act on this? Well, I think like any addiction, a lot of our patients have multiple factors that contribute to their addictions. And some people, it really is very psychosocial. It's really connected to their background and their past and the current situation they're in. But I do have some patients for whom it is so biochemical. They have this bio, this drive that feels disconnected from anything in their life and they get on medication and it just disappears. It just vanishes into thin air. And they really strongly feel that it was biochemical because their response to medication is so strong. So I'm sure it's a spectrum, just like addiction. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's get on to the article tonight. I really kind of love the article you picked for Journal Club. Unfortunately, I was gone from the live version, but we get to hear it tonight. Yeah, I feel like I should have left this article for you because you're a family doctor, so you treat little babies. But I just had to present it um, because I do work with a lot of pregnant women and they're super concerned about this topic. So this article, the title is The Act Now Collaborative the eat, sleep, console approach, or usual care for neonatal opioid withdrawal. This trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, April 30th, 2023. So it's a very new trial. And it just was really great. It was from this ACT Now Collaborative, which stands for the Advancing Clinical Trials in Neonatal Opioid Withdrawal. And they're part of the NIH HEAL initiative, which stands for Helping to End Addiction Long-Term. So let's start with some background. In utero, opioid exposure is common in the U.S., and it leads to high numbers of infants born with neonatal opiate withdrawal syndrome. So for some specific numbers, about 6.3 per 1,000 newborns in 2020 had neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, and in Pennsylvania, where we are, it's almost double that, so 13.3 per 1,000 births. The high nationally was in 2017, and it's been going down since then but it's still pretty high. And it's something that you will see if you care for pregnant women and their babies. Traditionally, kind of an old school practice is to use something called the Finnegan Neonatal Abstinence Scoring Tool to assess neonatal opioid withdrawal. So you use this scoring tool, it gives you a score that is supposed to tell you how much withdrawal the neonate is having, and then you give opiates to counteract that withdrawal. It's kind of like the baby version of like the cow's score that we use for adults. But there's not a lot of strong evidence that this is the best approach. It hasn't been compared head to head with other approaches in any really large, robust trials. And there have been concerns that this tool really overestimates the need for medication with opioids. So the kind of control group in this study is this Finnegan neonatal abstinence scoring tool. This article compared this tool, this Finnegan tool, to something we would call a function-based approach, the Eat, Sleep, Console. So this approach is more of a functional assessment of the infant's ability to do things. And the three things you're supposed to do as a baby is eat, sleep, and be consoled when you cry. So they see, is the infant eating? Is the infant sleeping? And can the infant be consoled? And then it uses non-pharmacologic interventions as first-line treatment. And it focuses on empowerment of families and caretakers to care for the infant. Opiates are only considered if all of those other methods were unsuccessful. So you evaluate the infant's ability to eat more than one ounce or breastfeed well, to sleep undisturbed for one hour, or to be consoled within 10 minutes of trying. So that's what Eat, Sleep, Console looks at. And there've been a bunch of QI initiatives that have been published about the implementation of an eat, sleep, console uh, strategy, but there's not a lot of data comparing it to other treatment methods, especially addressing health outcomes, not just in the hospital, but after discharge, which this trial looked at. So it looked at not just how the infants do 
during the withdrawal period, but how they did after discharge. John, do you have any experience with neonatal opiate withdrawal or the eat sleep console method? Yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I do do inpatient medicine, although I have not treated kind of neonatal abstinence syndrome since kind of residency, mostly due to the volume that we have at kind of our current institution. It really tends to go to a core group of pediatric hospitalists. That being said, I'm very familiar with the Finnegan and it was the best that we had. And, and it's a great tool, but it's very long. It's very tedious. The primary care doctor and me, I love the idea of like a more simplified approach. I, I kind of almost draw the analogy to depression where we used to have the Beck depression inventory or the, or the Zung inventory. And that was a very long test. And now we have the PHQ-9 and the PHQ-2. It makes it much just much easier. So I think that I love the idea of another way that's kind of functional to assess that could be done a little bit quicker and probably more reliably if it was quicker to do. Well, and like I said before, the Finnegan score really is the baby version of like the cow's score. So it looks at all these symptoms that are symptoms of withdrawal, such as increased muscle tone or frequent yawning, sweating, nasal stuffiness, sneezing. And then some other things that are more concerning, like poor feeding or vomiting. But we can't talk to these neonates, so it's not actually clear that these things are really clinically important. We just don't know. And we just sort of made the assumption extrapolating from adults. So this eat, sleep, console approach is just trying to look at factors that are really appropriate for and focusing on what a neonate might need. And just so you know, at St. Max's, we do use the eat, sleep, console method and our NICU at our mothership. So we've been using it for a while and I spoke with the pediatric hospitalists and they're all pretty happy that that's our protocol. So it's not new. It's been tested in a bunch of places. It is used pretty commonly, but this is like a big study really comparing it to this classic Finnegan method. All right, so let's talk about the specifics of the clinical question. So basically, the clinical question is, does the eat, sleep, console care approach for infants with neonatal opiate withdrawal syndrome reduce the time to discharge readiness compared to usual care with the Finnegan method. So the big thing they're looking at is, are you ready for discharge sooner or later than with the classic method? So who was in this study? It included 26 hospitals in the U.S. caring for infants born at 36 plus weeks. They had to have evidence of antenatal opioid exposure and had to have neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome using the Finnegan neonatal abstinence scoring tool. So the hospitals had to be using this Finnegan tool and using opiate replacement therapy to treat NOWS, neonatal opiate withdrawal syndrome. So the kind of people or population in this study were actually hospitals. Because as you can imagine, you can't have a hospital where half the babies in the nursery are getting one protocol and the other half are getting a second protocol and the nurses have to keep track of which baby gets which soothing technique and it just would be confusing. So the hospitals as a whole transitioned from Finnegan to Eat, Sleep, Console. They excluded hospitals that had less than 20 infants who were treated per year. They also excluded infants with major birth defects or any major medical problems at birth that might make one of the other protocols difficult to put into practice. Who was in this study? The people were mostly white, about 70% white, 13% black, 62% received what we would consider adequate prenatal care. So that's kind of sad. Um, 74% of the mothers were on medication for opiate use disorder. And of those, 63% were on buprenorphine and 25% were on methadone. So that's pretty good. 75% of the moms were getting medication, 26% were not. And the hospitals were spread all over the U.S., so they weren't clustered in any one particular region. The intervention was being randomly assigned a time to transition from Finnegan to Eat, Sleep, Console. Staff were trained to use this new approach, and there would be a three-month transition or training period during which time infants were not enrolled. So the hospital would have been using Finnegan, then they got a three-month time to all learn about Eat, Sleep, Console, and then they started Eat, Sleep, Console, and they collected data except during that three-month training period. They compared infants. So the comparison was infants receiving usual care for opioid withdrawal using Finnegan prior to the change to Eat, Sleep, Console. So they compared each hospital to itself before and after the intervention. The outcomes were interesting. The primary outcome was time from birth to medical readiness for discharge using a standard definition uh, developed by the American Academy of Pediatrics. 
they used medical readiness for discharge rather than actual discharge because they felt that there were a lot of issues unrelated to opioid withdrawal that might impact length of stay. These are infants who might have a lot of social issues. The mom might have housing issues. There might be custody or children and youth services issues that prevented the baby from going home right when it was medically ready. Or there could be babies who left early. That's the other thing that could have happened. So they went for medical readiness for discharge. Only 64% of the infants actually met medical readiness for discharge when they were discharged. So a lot of them got discharged earlier than would have been considered standard. I thought that was kind of interesting. So I'm just going to say what are the criteria they used. The criteria for medical readiness for discharge were defined as age of at least 96 hours. They had to update it to 72 hours when the guidelines changed right in the middle of their study. Uh, A period of at least 24 hours without the receipt of an opiate. Originally, it was 48 hours, but it went to 24. At least 24 hours with no respiratory support and 100% oral feeding and at least 24 hours of feeding at maximum caloric density. So basically, at least three days old, 24 hours without opioids, 100% eating as needed, and no respiratory support. So that's what it meant to be ready for discharge. 211 of the infants were discharged prior to 96 hours, so they were just discharged early a little bit, and a bunch of them were discharged less than 48 hours after receipt of an opiate. So they had gotten opiates initially, but were discharged before 48 hours had elapsed. So that's what took a lot of babies out of this study. They made them, they never met medical readiness for discharge. Secondary outcomes was the receipt of pharmacologic therapy to treat neonatal opiate withdrawal, length of stay, and some safety outcomes during the first three months of age. So they looked at a composite safety measure of in-hospital safety, unscheduled healthcare visits like going to the ED or urgent care, readmissions, non-accidental trauma, which means you know child abuse, the child was hurt, or death. And they included these safety outcomes because there were fears that if babies who were ill were discharged from the hospital too soon, it would be more difficult to care for, and maybe they would come to some kind of harm or adverse outcome once they got home. So that's the clinical question. John, what do you think of it? I mean, I think it's it's very kind of patient-centered outcome, right? We're kind of looking at length of stay and kind of receipt of pharmacotherapy for treatment of these kids. I think that's kind of like the, the million-dollar question is, how long do they have to stay in the hospital? Are we doing it the best way? Or are we just adding additional time for them in the hospital? Yeah. And from talking to women who do have babies who go through this, or families, not just the moms, it's the whole families who have to deal with this, the eat, sleep, console method where the baby stays in your hospital room with you is just so much better for the family. It's much less medicalized. Your baby's not kind of taken away and kept in the you know, the nursery or the NICU to be monitored. You know, as you said, the Finnegan score is very complicated and the baby's supposed to be monitored carefully. And then as soon as you're giving the baby opioids, it really needs to be monitored. And it disrupts that initial bonding time. And a lot of time it ends up not being necessary. Did you look in this study, did they have any kind of information or like supplement about patient satisfaction with the experience? I don't remember seeing that. I didn't see it either. I I think that's the only thing I really would have loved to see like added on was kind of the patient experience. Because I certainly hear, um, I think kind of rooming in has become standard practice at the hospital, kind of limited times in the the newborn nursery. Um, And certainly, I think that some people find that very helpful. I know it's good for baby. Some mothers find that very overwhelming at times. I'd like to see though, like before and after, you know, how mom dealt with this situation and how she felt with the experience, because I think that would be good other patient-centered information that I didn't see here. I'm sure some of the initial QI projects on this looked at that. We'll have to uh, do a little research. So let's talk about whether this trial is valid. First, some strengths. There were a lot of strengths. This was randomized. All the hospitals were compared to themselves before and after the transition, but they were randomized to a time to make that transition. It was multi-center and took place at a diverse set of hospitals, and that improves generalizability. The sample size was large. They had 1,305 infants in 26 hospitals that were enrolled. Only 837 eventually met the criteria for the primary outcome. And that's because the others were discharged prior to meeting discharge readiness, as I said before. They needed to enroll at least 864 infants, and they enrolled close to that, 837, who met all criteria for the primary outcome. So I think the sample size was pretty pretty good. They did do an intention-to-treat analysis for all enrolled infants. 
the groups were balanced at baseline. The only thing that was different between the two groups, if you think of Finnegan as one group and Eat, Sleep, Console as the other, of course, each group had the same hospital in each group, was Hispanic mothers, the proportion of Hispanic mothers. And that just reflected the random timing of the transition for hospitals with large Hispanic populations. So some of the hospitals with a lot of Hispanic mothers transitioned later. And so more Hispanic women ended up in the earlier group than in the later group. They did the analysis twice. As I said, the criteria for discharge readiness changed in 2020. The American Academy of Pediatrics updated it. So they had to update their criteria to define discharge readiness. But this didn't change the outcome. They kind of ran the data twice using both criteria, and it was the outcome was the same. Um, I thought the results were clinically significant, and they had meaningful clinical impact on the patients. They did report adverse events, and it was funded by the NIH HEAL initiative and a bunch of other grants. So I don't think any of that funding was going to cause bias. So I thought this study had a lot of strengths. There were a few weaknesses I'll just bring up. One, it wasn't blinded. You couldn't blind the participants to what intervention they were receiving. I thought the trial was a little vulnerable to some temporal trends because Eat, Sleep, Console became more popular over the duration of the trial. So even if a hospital wasn't officially doing Eat, Sleep, Console, parents may have insisted on some of those interventions that they had learned about independently. Nursing may have started doing some of those console strategies before giving out opioids, even if it weren't the official protocol. So Eat, Sleep, Console became more popular even outside the trial. It's also possible that there were some kind of unmeasured differences between the two groups kind of before and after the initiation because it's a complex protocol and inherent in that are things that you can't account for that are different between the two groups. You know, the babies have to spend a lot more time with their parents in Eat, Sleep, Console. Did that make a difference as opposed to it being the Eat, Sleep, Console itself? You know, there's just a bunch of other things involved in a complex protocol like this. Another problem with this trial was that COVID-19 disrupted it, of course. So I think that contributed to some of the earlier discharges. People just wanted to get home, get out of the hospital. They weren't allowed to have visitors. They were afraid of getting COVID. So a lot of people got discharged earlier than they might have otherwise. There also were potential staffing shortages, changes in caretaker visitation policies that may have influenced the results. So they're not sure how COVID-19 influenced it, but it certainly would have had an influence. And it lacks outcomes longer term beyond three months. So I think three months is adequate, but it's possible there'll be some difference between the two groups if you went out beyond three months. So John, did you think this was a valid trial? Yeah, I think for most of the reasons you said, I like the fact that using kind of each hospital's own control group that does a really good job of kind of grounding the data. I think that the only kind of real red flag that you mentioned or thing that's kind of like the, the X factor is that, you know, instead of it being a crossover design, COVID was occurring during this period of time. And I think that healthcare as a whole, we've kind of reassessed what has to be in the hospital. I think we've been pushing people out of the hospital much quicker during that period and since that period. So that's kind of the only thing that's unmeasured, confounding that I think could be probable here. Well, and like the authors said, all these things about length of stay, they have to do with more than just how healthy you are. And if you've recovered, there's just a lot of contributors to length of stay. And they did use discharge readiness. They tried to be more objective. And then half their people, or not half, but a good number of their babies got discharged early anyway, even though they tried to be objective. So let's talk about the results. Basically, remember, the clinical question was, does using Eat, Sleep, Console change the time it takes to become ready for discharge in the hospital compared to the Finnegan method? So bottom line, Yes, it does. There was a significant difference. And the babies in the Eat, Sleep, Console group got out a lot earlier than the Finnegan group. So the number of days from birth to readiness for hospital discharge was on average 8.2 in Eat, Sleep, Console and was 14.9 in the Finnegan group. The use of medication was reduced by about 32% in the Eat, Sleep, Console group. And the adverse outcomes, both during and after, were similar between the two groups. So a huge difference. Again, eight days in Eat, Sleep, Console, almost 15 days in the Finnegan group. If you look at length of stay, the mean length of stay in Eat, Sleep, Console was 7.8 days. Mean length of stay in the Finnegan group was 14 days. Eat, Sleep, Console group, about 20% received opioids. Finnegan, about 52% received opioids. And safety events were the same. The composite safety event outcome was about 16% in both groups. These results were consistent over time, consistent across sites. There was some heterogeneity of treatment effects, but it was pretty consistent overall. 
So the two groups were very, very different. And Eat, Sleep, Console came out on top for shorter length of stay. I can't imagine staying in the hospital for 15 days after you uh, have a newborn, especially if you have other kids at home. That's a massive difference, right? And so long. I think I had to stay four days after I had my first because there was a C-section. And I was so done by like day three. Yeah, I can't imagine. I think the longest we were there for a week. And that's my poor wife had a four-day induction for one of the kids. But 14, 15 days, that's crazy. Yeah, that's just really painful for everyone involved. So another thing I look at when looking at results is I always ask the question, what information can you get from the trial other than the primary results? Because these trials are rich in information. So there were a few things I learned. One, breastfeeding. They looked at breastfeeding rates as one of their outcomes, and that was low in both groups. The rates of breastfeeding at discharge were 19.5% versus 32.7%. So 19.5% in Finnegan group and 327 in the Eat Sleep Console group. So more breastfeeding in the Eat Sleep Console group. But you compare this to data showing that in 2018, 82% of U.S. mothers initiated breastfeeding. So breastfeeding was very low in this group of infant parent dyads. Also, adequate prenatal care rates were very low. I think I said at the beginning, 60-something percent of women received what we would consider adequate prenatal care. And Many of these infants were discharged early, and we can guess, is it from COVID? Is it from who knows what? But this is a high-risk population who need a lot of support, and they really should not be being discharged early. They should, if anything else, they should stay longer to receive all the support they need to make sure the babies are well, to make sure everything is set up for home. I, you'd think they would stay longer, but they actually got discharged earlier. So in conclusion, compared with usual care with the Finnegan score, the Eat, Sleep, Console care approach reduced the number of days until infants with NOWS were ready for hospital discharge, and there was no increase in adverse events. That's the bottom line. So will these results help us in patient care? You know, looking at this, my patients were similar to those in this study. I do treat pregnant people with opiate use disorder, and they're often very concerned about neonatal opiate withdrawal. The treatment is feasible in my setting. Our hospital, St. Max's, does use the Eat, Sleep, Console method. And I thought the results were clinically significant and they're things my patients would be interested in, which is when will the baby be well enough to go home? Benefits were less time in the hospital, improved breastfeeding rates, less medication, and they did not demonstrate any harms of the intervention. So I would say confidently that the benefits outweighed the harm in this study. So in conclusion, I can tell my patients that we are using Eat, Sleep, Console. It will lead to earlier discharges better breastfeeding, and I can confidently recommend that my patients seek out hospital care where this protocol is in place to care for them and their infants after birth. Yeah, I definitely think that this study kind of points to the fact that, well, I think we kind of got here off of the back of the Finnegan. This this is probably the new standard of care. And it seems like there's just so many reasons from a patient-centered outcomes perspective why this works better. It's easier to administer. I mean, that reduction in time in the hospital is, is massive. And then, you know, breastfeeding rates as well. I know that that's something kind of tracked at a hospital level very closely. Also from like a a hospital rating standpoint, the number of mothers breastfeeding. So that's kind of another useful metric for hospital systems. I just think all in all, this seems like a win for patients. Yeah. And if I just imagine myself in this situation, it's definitely the protocol that I would want to use for myself or for my baby if they were going through this. Well, thanks for presenting that article. That was great. It was pretty fun. All right. So a couple of uh, talk back here. We got an email from Dr. Thrakar, um, the lead author of the paper we profiled in episode 22 on using short acting opioid agonists to treat opioid use disorder in the hospital. He wrote, uh, thank you very much for discussing this article. I just listened to the podcast and feel honored on behalf of our team that you both had such a thoughtful, nuanced and patient centered discussion about the topic intervention and paper. Well, thank you so much. We really enjoyed covering that paper. And I actually thought that was very perspective uh, changing for me. So I, I really enjoyed that one. So thank you so much for all you do. Yeah, I I really enjoyed it too. And I just want to tell our listeners, you know, everyone is like really nice. We get a lot of nice comments, but you're welcome to disagree with us. If you have something not so nice to say, please send it to us. Or, well, you know, it should still be nice, but we're happy to take any and all comments. So if you think what we said was not right or just completely full of it, let us know and we'll put that comment on the air as well. Yeah, perspective is always good. So welcome other people's perspective on these things. 
Thank you for listening to the Addiction Medicine Journal Club. The best part of any journal club is a conversation and we want to hear what you have to say. To have your opinions about the article included in a future episode, send us your comments on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, email, or join our Facebook group. The links are in the show notes. Original theme music was composed and performed by Benjamin Kennedy. Audio editing by Aaron McHugh. Video production by Spencer Kennedy. Production by Dr. Patrick Beeman and Ars Longa Media. Addiction Medicine Journal Club is intended for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. The views expressed here are our own and do not necessarily reflect those of our employers or the authors of the articles we review. All patient information has been modified to protect their identities. Thank you for being part of the conversation and have a great day.